Next verse. Very next verse. Then the high priest rose up, and all they that all that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation, and laid their hands on the apostles, and put them in the common prison. That's just to show love. You see, we should always show love. But we have a little bit of a problem when we say, just show love. What do you mean by that? You see, showing love has now come to mean, in 21st century Christianity, showing love has now come to mean allow people to be uncomfortable in their godless, or comfortable, comfortable in their godless condition. If they're godless and under the condemnation of God, make them feel comfortable, and that's loving. What a, what a complete disaster. And what a shame. You know, my first statement, love is often not appreciated or understood. Is that true? Parents. Parents, is that true? Love is often not appreciated or understood. Yeah, good old-fashioned discipline moment. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> Appreciate the love. It's not appreciated. At least at that moment. Love may promote violence. Now, what do I mean by that? Let me ask you something. When God took his people to Babylon for 70 years, in a violent way, quite frankly, was that an act of love? Sure was. It was it was the only way he could keep them. He, he could even keep them as his people. He had sent prophet after prophet to them, and they just told me he had lost something they killed. Jeremiah ministered and he pleaded, he cried, and he did everything. And all they could do with him was put him in a pit, come up with false prophets to fight against him, threaten to kill him, and they almost did one and well on more than one occasion. Finally, God just drags him off as as an act of love. See, the only way we can define love, and I'm okay with showing love, as long as God gets to define what love is, right? We can't, we're not qualified to define the word. Love without truth is not love. It is hate. Remember what our atheist friend said at the beginning? And he's exactly right. You really believe that God is exists and that there's heaven and there's hell and you won't tell me about it and he said that later on in that video he says how much would you have to hate a person not to tell them the truth I'll tell you what that's ringing around in my head an atheist how much would you have to hate a person not to tell them the truth no one loved more than Christ who then got tortured to death for all his love. Love is often interpreted as hate. Is it not? Is it not? You know, if we're going to depend on everybody else to define love for us and tell us what it is, we'll after a while do what they want us to do because they'll tell us what love is and what love isn't. Speaking up against abortion. Act of love or act of hate? Speaking up against perversion, sodomy, act of love or act of hate. It's often interpreted as hate. Streetwise the wise theology's water cooler warrior training will take you where you need to go. Yes. And every young man who's ever read a comic book has seen the Charles Atlas comic. The way it starts out, you can't see it, unfortunately, but it uh, starts out there on the left side, you know, where skinny, wimpy guy is at the beach with girlfriend. Big muscle-bound guy kicks sand in his face and insults him. Skinny guy goes home, kicks the chair. It's hard to see it right there. I don't want to use my pointer. It's uh, right. Well, if I use this pointer, I just don't want to do it. Right 
that one, right? He's mad. He's got his Charles Atlas book out, and he's mad. He's going to go lift weights now, and so he does. And there he is, this next one right here. Now he's really building up his muscles, and you know what happens next, right? He goes back to the beach with his girlfriend, right? And now he punches out the muscle-bound guy, and uh, now, of course, his girlfriend loves him. Well, okay. Street Y Theology's water cooler warrior training isn't going to quite do that for you. <coughs> but it'll get you on the way. Is that an act of love? With the muscle bound guy? Yeah, I think it was. <laughs> I, mean, I think it was. I mean, it'll make him think twice about you know, something else. But I, I, I would really encourage him to stay away from that girl. Do not marry that girl. If she likes you only because you're muscle bound. Um, I don't know what's going to happen when he's 45, you know what I'm saying? All right. <laughs> Through water cooler training, you will gain useful knowledge of biblical truth. You will practice with real life scenarios. And we do practice in our training. You got to practice, see what happens. <laughs> and most of the time, we have these apologetics courses, we go out and learn new information. But we don't practice. Kind of funny in the uh, course I'm teaching on Sunday mornings. When I said we're going to practice next week, you you, you could see the I mean, like, what are we going to have to do? I, mean, I got these questions, and uh, I told myself I'm going to be paying attention to who comes next week. I want to know who's serious about this training. They were pretty good about it. They came. But even that morning, I mean, people I said we're just we're just role playing. That's all we're doing. And we sat around, and that's what that's what we do in the class. You're the observer, you're the Christian, and you're the attacking atheist or whatever. And here's what you're going to say, and you have to defend it, and you have to watch. And I'll tell you what, it's a little dicey. Little, little, little dicey. But we know, don't we, folks, that if we can't do it among our friends in a role-playing situation, we know that if we can't do it there, it ain't happening out there. Right? We know that. So we've got to practice. It's not just enough to have a little bit of knowledge. You've got to get out there and you've got to, you've got to put it to the test. Skills and tactics. Again, it's not just about knowledge when you're out there. There's skills involved. There's tactics. Someone speaks up and is real loud. Do you speak up just as loud or are you quiet? How about someone speaks up and... Uh, you can't think of anything right then, but it takes five seconds, and then you say something. You got that five seconds in there. Is it is it as effective after the five seconds as it would have been if you would have spoken up right away? Do you know what Peter tells us to be able, be able to speak up right away? Remember what Peter says, 1 Peter 3.15, be ready always to give an answer to every man who asks you of the hope that is in within you with meekness and fear. See what I'm saying? Be ready. Be ready already to give an answer to everyone. There's three kind of broad statements that he, that he says are be ready, always, and every man. You think Peter's trying to tell us to be ready before it happens? Finally, the all-day water cooler warrior training seminar is going to take place on Saturday, March the 31st at Weaver, Market, at Weaver Markets in Adamstown. The cost is $25 to pre-register, $30 at the door. It includes lunch and a field manual that we are they were putting together. I truly believe that this is the most effective training in, in apologetics, in guerrilla apologetics you've ever had. How many of us have gone to apologetics training fill our heads with all kinds of knowledge, and then when it really comes down to it, when it's time to use it, man, we just can't remember what it was all about. We will train you how to interact, not by filling your head, head with knowledge, but by teaching you train tactics and skills that you can use. How to come back with that very, very penetrating question. As an illustration, this happened to me one time, I was in a Redner's Quick Mart. And a man came in and he picked up the newspaper and he started ripping a, a well-known Christian evangelist. Now, I was not a fan then of that Christian evangelist, and I'm not now. He's still alive. He just started ripping them right out loud. Is this, is it, look at this, look at this preacher. 
Is that any way a Christian should act? I mean, God was like talking to whoever would listen. His head was back. He was just saying throughout the throughout the whole place. You couldn't help but hear. Now, question for you. Was it really about the Christian preacher? Was that what it was really about? I was standing right there. What to do? I didn't come back and lecture him for talking about the Christian preacher that way. All I did was come back with a question. That's all I did. And I said, I'm giving this away a little bit. I said, so, I was just as loud as he was. Whoever heard him was going to hear me. I said, so, what does a good Christian preacher do in this situation? What do you think happened next? That, that decibel level went down so far. He started just talking real quiet. He said, well, I, 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 you know, I, I just don't think he should be done. I said, yeah, and I was loud again. I said, yeah, you, you're telling what he shouldn't do. Now, you obviously know something about Christian preachers because you're, you're, you're so opinionated about it. Tell me what he should have done. And by this time, the dear young man was, was kind of done with the whole conversation. He got very, very quiet, and we were able to have a decent conversation between us. But I didn't lecture him. All I did was ask a, a pointed question. <coughs> you, yes, you, can learn how to do this. You can do it. Now, Brooker and Marissa are not here tonight, but to register, go to www.thinkingreform.org. I don't think we have a, a page of three wise. I'm sorry, we have a page of three wise theology.com. If you go there, you can register. I don't think you can register yet at thinkingreform.org. I don't think we can. But if you go to www.streetwisetheology.com, you can register there. $25 if you register early, $30 at the door. And um, this will be the first time we've actually uh, took it past a, you know, in a public venue. We've done it, in, I'm doing it in the church right now, doing it here, but this is just an intro course. Well, thanks for your kind attention here tonight. Again, we apologize for the uh, technical difficulties, but I trust you were able to follow along. Are there any questions? Yes, Bob? Don't you think that if we just live our Christian lives in front of people, that eventually they will ask us why we are living so wonderfully and we'll be able to testify to them then? I think there's two. Did everybody hear the question? <laughs> if we just live our lives, They'll come and they'll question and then they'll uh, want to be like us, right? Yes. They want to be want to be just like us. Yeah. Um, one of the most honest people I think that ever lived was Paul. Uh, I think I think he was guileless. I, I really do. Um, did you know the word love is not in the Book of Acts one time? Did you know that? There's other words in there, though, like uh, tumult, riot, <laughs> upside down, that kind of stuff. I mean, it was, I mean, read that Paul, he couldn't go anywhere without getting thrown out violently in places. Wasn't that because he talked too much? Yeah, he, he, he just, yeah, <laughs> you know, he just like, had the wrong attitude. <laughs> he, was a, he was a guileless man, and he, and he truly loved his neighbor. And that's what got him in trouble. Because he taught, and that's what God, Christ, Christ wasn't put to death for anything that he did, but he told people they needed to worship him, and they didn't want to hear it. And ultimately, our message is not necessarily one that they want to hear. Oh, it would be so nice. Just, just become good at, at, at that coffee and donuts thing. Bagels and cream cheese. They'll all just come streaming, streaming into the church. Now, now, it didn't work for Christ. It didn't work that way for Paul or Jeremiah. Yes, Beth. I just thought it was interesting. You were talking about, you know, actions speaking loud in the words, and Annie pointed out that the uh, atheist that you talked about in that film judged the Christians on their actions. Yeah. We are going to get judged on our actions yep. by other people as well as the Lord. Sure, sure. And that's, that's throughout the scriptures. Right. It, it, it is absolutely throughout the 
Jesus, which is all, all over the place. It certainly is. Anyone else? Yes, Ralph. I just want to say it, it, it's something to me because just what you're talking about, believe it or not, I'm up on the roof of a building in the rain today talking to a guy. And he says, do you think you're going to heaven? He said, yeah, I believe I'm going to heaven. But we start talking about exactly this. And it gets me thinking about, uh, you know, the term Christian. For me, when I came to the Lord, I was in a little bit of trouble and whatnot. So I always go back to that day, and I, I try to ask myself, are you a Christian? Was that something that I felt I needed to do at that moment because I was in a little bit of trouble and whatnot? And I, from my heart of hearts, did turn to the Lord and wanted to. Right. But it wasn't like flicking a switch on. So every day I struggle with that stuff in my mouth and things in my actions, just like you're talking about. But people see it and they know that I profess to be a Christian. But my actions don't always show that. Right. So it, 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 it's a struggle. I, I mean, we were talking today about, you know, it, the Lord definitely tells you what He expects. If you're going to follow a, a demon or, or the, you follow that or follow me, but there is no. And I think as people... You mean there's no compromise between the two? Right, there is. Play, right? Right. He, right. He tells us specifically what he expects of us as Christians as we claim to be. Right, right. Not that we're perfect. And I think as people, or it, it's easy to put under the category of, well, I'm not perfect. Yeah, I'm a right. Christian. Well, I'm not perfect. Yeah. But yeah. we can do it. It's our own, at least for me, my own self-wants, my own junk that clouds that. But I can say this. Days like this, when I talk about things and I come to a meeting like this, and they are right in line, I see when my eyes are open to it and want to hear the Lord. He's there talking to me all the time. I just am clouded. So I just think the word Christian... <coughs> For me, for me, it is a walk. It's a slow walk that will take me the rest of my life that I'm growing. I hope to be the man that God wants me to be because of him. Yeah, yeah. You know what? You know what happens? Sometimes they want to put us in the category of everybody else say, well, you fail. Well, here's the, here's the, yeah, we do fail. Here's the difference. Without Christ, you succeed in doing the wrong thing. With Christ, you may fail at doing the right thing. Big fat difference. You know, if I'm trying to, I don't know, if I'm trying to drown somebody and I succeed, that's really pretty different than trying to save somebody from drowning and perhaps failing. Big difference. No one puts all the same category. Yeah, you're, you're just like us. No. No, no we're not. Right, because I, I, to me, I'm, I'm still rotten. I fail every day and it bothers me every day. Sure. I try to get better and I try to grow because of the Lord. Now, your unbelieving friends, do you think it bothers them when they succeed at doing bad things? Think they're real worried about that? No. Nah. nah, not really. Not really. You know, Proverbs tells us about wicked people. says, you know, you've heard this term all the time, right? How can you go to sleep at night? Well, Proverbs talks about wicked people that don't go to sleep unless what? Unless they do do bad things. Someone else. Do you think the state of witnessing in the North American churches is, is in pretty good shape? Or do you think, uh, what do you think? Pathetic. The Greek word for witness yeah. is order. I don't see a lot of orders. You know, we talk about how we uh, we would give our life for Christ. Yeah, we give our life for wait a minute. We give our life for Christ. Man, we can't give up a little piece of our reputation for Christ. Are you kidding me? And we're gonna march off and face the lions. We are. Man, we got we got much smaller battles to fight now. We're, we're not fighting them. Yes. I think that we're losing. We're now, our society is, we're now in a state where it is politically incorrect to be a Christian, to express anything. 
Yes, yeah, certainly. A, a generation ago, maybe two generations ago, culturally speaking, it was the unbelievers who were sort of on the on the hot seat, if you will, the guilt. Hey, you know, I should hear that. I should go to church. You know, I, I should be right. But now, it's the believers that are the ones who are on trial just because they're a believer. They're already on trial. Yes? And I just want to say that I think in America, it looks like the Christian church is in retreat. Not necessarily in other parts of the world where they are speaking out. They are taking the risks as Christians um, in their society and they're choosing Christ um, and, and counting the cost for that. Sure. But in America, I don't think we're doing that. We, we have convinced ourselves that we can be quiet and we, we can be comfortable and we can still be great witnesses. We, we convinced ourselves of that. It's, it's, it's pitiful. You know, one thing, too, we want to make clear tonight, we make this clear in the, in the course. We want to make this clear tonight as well. There's a couple different categories of people. There are honest, honest questioners. But there are also hostile rebels. And we dare not get them mixed up in how we treat them. We dare not do that. How do we know a person's an, an honest questioner? I think one of the ways, yes? Um, I actually just had an exchange with a, a man on Facebook. And he started out with questions that I assumed he was an honest questioner. And then the moment it started to get where he was asking specific questions like, oh, so you wouldn't, it, it started out with politics. That went to religion really fast, but they're, they're the same. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They are. It, to me, they are. To him, they weren't. Uh, and he he said because um, I said the two aren't separate for me. And he said, so you would you would say that because the Bible says the woman shouldn't lead, you never vote for a woman president. And he started asking questions like that, but he was like really hitting home like on things that like Audrey said were politically incorrect. Where it was like you're a hater now because you don't believe in this, you know. And it was. It was like, okay, this isn't genuine anymore. Right. Because the yeah. question started to get hostile. Yeah. In, in, in Christ's ministry, and this is another reason why I, I felt that I, I really wanted to pursue this whole, this whole summer idea. One thing I, I realized after a while was that you just don't hear, well, we hear Christ's ministry. We almost always talk about his, his personal ministry. And what do we talk about? We talk about Christ, the woman of the well, right? Christ and Nicodemus, that kind of thing. I ask for a raise of hands. How many have ever heard a sermon on Christ versus the crowds when things got nasty and the names got, got started getting thrown around and they wanted to kill him? And then, yet he still came, came right back out of the sense of things that we don't think are very loving. Ever heard a sermon on that? You know, that, that takes up an awful lot of Christ's ministry. Think about that for a minute. Christ, you can go almost any chapter in the Gospels, almost any one, and you will see some hostile exchanges, excuse me, exchanges between Christ and his enemies. And we aren't talking about it in the Christian church. Something's not right. Something's way wrong. Yes, Jim? I, I think, you know, tw 25 years ago, even in the average evangelical church, if you would have start a discussion about the concept of victory. Let's talk about victory. People would have brought up, um, can we close down an abortion thing? You know, can we at least do something about public education? Can we, it, it, it would have been spoken of in terms of the culture. If you bring up the subject of victory in almost all of our churches today, that stuff isn't even, that's not even on the table anymore. It's all, Oh, you can you quit smoking? It, it's all internalized and spiritualized. That, the whole concept of victory is not even. Yeah. It, it's gone. <laughs> you, you know what? And, and, and since I've been doing this, I have people say, well, what about. We shouldn't argue. I mean, uh, you can't argue people into the kingdom of heaven. What about that? Well, first of all, Christ was one serious arguer. Right? I mean, can we can we agree on that point? I mean, John John is interesting to me. We talk about this in the seminar. John is the apostle of love. He he uses the word love more than if you take all of his epistles, if you take his gospel and his epistles, he uses the word love 
and believe more than the other three gospel writers combined. Did you ever read his gospel? I mean, he spends whole chapters on, the, on these wars going on between Christ and those who, and his enemies. Remember the one about the guy who was blind? And, they, and the Pharisees went and throw him out of the synagogue? It takes a whole chapter, and there's all kinds of drama going on. John has another word that he likes to use, especially in his epistles, and that's the word liar. Do you know the apostle of love is also, also the apostle of calling people liars? This is news to us. We're just not used to thinking this way. Yes, right. Yeah, like you said early in the outline, <clears throat> If we feel the urgency, if we feel if a train was going to hit somebody in here, we, we would do our best to, at that moment, do something about it. And people die all the time, every minute, every second. And that is what we're supposed to do. Why do we not, why is the emergency not there? And well, at least I know I don't do it. I don't go up to people through my daily walk and make it apparent to them that you need to not to force it down their throat, but I, I really don't make that great of an attempt to reach them. Yeah, and, and you know what? I mean, obviously we can't witness to everybody. We just, we, we just live right here. But one of the things that concerns me about what we're talking about is, you know, when a person gets hostile about Christ, they are giving you permission to speak up. Did you know that? When they start speaking up about God, or His Word, or His Son, they have just now given you an opportunity to speak back. They started it. We need to, we need to at least take those opportunities. At least. At least. If we're not taking those, then which ones are we taking? Yes, Jack. Well, I had a question. Um, we talk a lot about, you know, uh, arguments. Yes. You know, arguing between, you know, uh, an issue or, or whatever. Yes. But to me, Christ a lot of times, you know, I mean, he got personal. I mean, he I mean, he called people vipers and serpents, things like that. And for me, I know I wouldn't, you know, go around calling people vipers, you know, or sons, or liars or hypocrites. Or, I mean, how do you? How do you? I don't know. How do you put that? I mean, I, I, we want to be like Christ, and that's how he argued. So how do we, you know, use that type of, you know, offensive in our arguments? You know. Yeah something we talk about as well. Let's ask this question right now. Was Christ offensive? Yes. It sure was. In fact, there's a passage in Mark. It says right clearly when he, when he came into the, to the temple back in Nazareth and said, uh, you know, prophets without honor in his own, in his own country. And by the way, guys, uh, the only one ever healed, healed from leprosy was a non-Israelite. And, uh, you know, when Elisha had to stay with somebody, he didn't pick any Israelite family. He went out of Israel to stay there. And uh, by the time they were done, they wanted to kill him. And it says, and they were offended at him. So, I'm here to tell you tonight that the more offensive you are, the more Christ-like you are. Now, how do you like that? Actually, I will say this. I've had this discussion with some people. And, you know, even, even some men who've had some Bible training and said, look, you know, you want me to be like Christ? Look at what he got into. Look at the things he said and did. Look at the enemies that he made. And you know what I've gotten on more than one occasion? Well, we're not Jesus. Jesus can do that stuff. I'm like, wait a minute. You know, when it's all nice and comfy, we're supposed to be like Jesus. But when it gets hot, oh, we're not Jesus. I would respond this way, Shaq. I would say, first of all, yeah, we can't really know as much as what Christ knew. We can't do that. He knew who he was talking to, especially in Matthew 12. He knew, he knew that once they rejected him in Matthew 12, the scribes and Pharisees, and he says, I'm going to send, I'm going to send priests, prophets, I'm going to send all kinds of people, and you're going to kill them. You're never going to repent, is what he told them at that point. I'm not so sure that we can know all those things, but we can speak the truth, no matter how offensive it is. And so if we can make what's actually true in God's word our uh, offense, then we're doing something good. Unfortunately, and this happens all the time in Facebook and Internet arguments, you can see it again and again, it starts out a decent discussion, somebody calls somebody stupid, and then the other person says, I'm not stupid, and it just goes, 
south right away. You know, and this is something we talk about too. It's really interesting to see what Christ defended and what he didn't defend. He did not defend himself for, for, for the most part. He defended his works. He defended his father. He defended the scriptures. If you and I go out there to defend ourselves, we're, we're, we're missing it. Who are we? Honestly, we're already dead soon. Even if we all live to be 90, we're going to be dead soon. We're not worth defending. Every time God showed himself to someone in the scriptures, what did they see themselves as? Dust and ashes, right? Which is, which is accurate. They finally got a true view of themselves. Let's not worry about defending ourselves. Let's worry about defending God, his son, and his word. Yes, John? Just to follow up on Shaq's question, it seems to me that the questioning approach is the, the approach that best puts us on the offensive because it allows, the question allows the, uh, the insulter to convict himself. Just like what you did in that, in the Redners, all those years ago. You know, well, what should he have done? And all of a sudden, they don't have the answers, or they see themselves as hypocrites. And they're doing the conviction, not, not yourself. Right. You don't have to know their heart. If you ask the, if you ask the questions, it, it may be the very best way to go on the offense. And that's one of the things we want to teach you how to do, is, is become skilled at asking that incisive question. It does a lot of things. Someone gets loud against God, against his word, you come up with an incisive question, all of a sudden they know that they got a problem on their hands. You see, we, we just we, we just go out defending, right? All we've got is our is our is our shield, right? But if we're gonna get up against somebody we've got a sword and a or a shield and a sword, now they're gonna have to be careful what they say. But if I just go out with my shield, the other guy can wail away all day with his sword or whatever, and he's never going to have to worry about me at all. We go out with a shield and a sword, right? And, and you know, there's nothing to make a person back off quick and just, just gather themselves together like a good question. And then that gives you time to think. 